there. Okay, this is, uh, if you need to speed up, go ahead and speed up, because there's going to be several more of these. So if you need to get a little closer, get a little closer. Oh, you, you went too far. Back up once. Back up. Back up. Back up one. There we go. Okay, this, if you, this shows the geological situation. So what's going on is Israel has a, a fault line that runs right through it. In fact, from all the way down here, all the way up this side, that's what's called the, the East Bank. And that's the Jordan River Valley right there. Runs all the way through. Jerusalem's right over here. Mediterranean's at the top over here. It kind of goes out this way. So this, you can't see it, but this right here, that's all silt. The geological plate has pulled away and everything dropped. And so the Jordan River has dropped silt in there. So that's all silt built up. Now this is the Dead Sea down here. And that's like 38% salt. You can't, you can't dive, it's like hard, it's like gel. And so uh, that's the Dead Sea. And then the Jordan River goes all the way back up through here. And this is the Sea of Galilee, which is not a sea, it's a lake. And you've heard it also called the Lake of Genezareth and some other things. But this is the area we're going to be in today. But this, the Dead Sea is about 1,700, 1,800 feet below sea level. And, and that gives you the idea of the geology. So there's, there's been earthquakes over there forever. Civilizations have, have just disappeared because of the massive earthquakes that have happened over in this area. Uh, and if you look up and see, down here is Africa. Over here is Eurasia. And this is kind of a land bridge. This is actually for traveling and trade and stuff. This is the way to go. And you could also go up this way. It's hot. There's, there's some water in there. But you can travel. It's fairly flat. But you can go along the Jordan River up to that way, too. So there's two routes. But there's mountains in between. See this central, central mountain range right in there. So you could cross over into here. And you could go up and down this way and up and down this way. But going up to Jerusalem is kind of a funny place. Uh, Everything is uphill to Jerusalem. So when they say going up to Jerusalem, they mean literally going up. All right? All right. So let's go to the, see if we can get the next slide on here. Let's see. It's not, my clicker isn't clicking. Thank you, John. So this is the nation of Israel, essentially, up in here. And again, there's the Dead Sea. This is Jordan over here. You've got uh, Lebanon up here. Uh, again, this is uh, the, the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum is on the northwest shore up in there. But that's the Jordan River. Jesus would have been baptized. Let's see if I can find Jerusalem. I can't even read. I can't read Jerusalem in there, but it should be right about in here. Jesus would have been. There's Jericho. So Jerusalem's right over here. Jericho is right there. Jesus would have been baptized by John somewhere right down here, just, just below Jericho. But anyway, uh, one more slide. Moving ahead. I just want to give you kind of an overview, and then we're going to get into some other stuff here real quick. You're going to let me do it? Oh, I went too far. That's all right. That's all right. We'll just stay there. Don't go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. So this is the Sea of Galilee. This was that small body of water up, up northern Israel. And the Sea of Galilee is here. 90% of Jesus' ministry is spent around this lake. 90%. It's a beautiful place. If I was going to be a ministry, you know, I used to ask God, if I could be a beach ministry, that'd be great. But here I am in Manford, Oklahoma. But I did get by the lake, so that's good. That's good. Uh, so this is, anyway, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long, and it's about, uh, oh, six miles wide. It's not very wide. You can see, from here, you can see both ends. You know, you get up on this high point, you can see both sides. Uh, now, Capernaum's going to be right up in here. All right, there's a little, that, in fact, that's what that says, Capernaum. And the Jordan comes out in this area, dumps into the Sea of Galilee. That comes from uh, all the way up into Jordan. And over here on this side of the lake, the reason so many people are over here on this side, I'm losing my, I'm losing my pointer. But anyway, there are some uh, uh, springs that dump into the lake over there. So the fish gather over there because that's where all the springs dump in. There's nutrients. The little fish are over there. They're down, you know. 
everything that there is to eat is over on that side. So that's where John, and, or actually Peter, and some of his brothers, and some of those fishermen, that's where they're from, right in there. That's their hot spot. And there's a reason for that, because that's where the fish are. So uh, anyway, uh, up, up north, just, just here to the north of this, is where a lot of rockets are coming in from Lebanon right now. Uh, this is a lot of agriculture up in here. You've got, it's part of the Fertile Crescent, you've got uh, bananas, uh, you've got all sorts of fruits and dates and nuts. Uh, <clears throat> when it says land flowing with milk and honey, it, it's date honey. It's not bees, but dates from palm trees. They, they, hang, they hang down in large clumps, and then they process that. It's very sweet. It tastes just like honey. So that's the land of milk and honey. And <clears throat> again, it goes over to this direction, but this is all fertile ground in here. You're just driving by fields and fields and fields of crops, uh, which is why other people like the area, because everything else around is a desert. So it's, it's important. Uh, anyway, uh, like I said, up north, uh, Lebanon's launching rockets down in, and not many get through. Uh, what typically happens is the, uh, the Iron Dome, or the, whatever they're calling it, uh, shoots the rockets down while they're still in the sky. But they blow up, and so you've got shrapnel fall. So when you hear things uh, uh, falling, uh, when you hear sirens go off, you basically need to get indoors. Uh, you need to get indoors because there's going to be shrapnel falling very soon. So as soon as the shrapnel is done falling, then you can go back outside. But typically what they say is seven to ten minutes after the sirens stop, then you can go out of wherever you're at, uh, and then you can go back out and get on with life. Uh, and it's a very intricate uh, process and how that one got through over in, uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, they're still not sure. That actually went over Egypt, out into the sea, and came back. Uh, and it came all the way from Iran, which is uh, you know 1,600 miles to the south and, and east. So it was an interesting thing. But anyway, that got through, uh, but that's one of the few. So that just gives you a little bit of history uh, on the area. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. There we go. So now we're in Capernaum, and you probably know her. I'm not sure what happened to her, but she's uh, uh, she is doing better. But she had a cough fit this morning. That might be what's going on. Uh, but anyway, that's Capernaum. As you go into the city now and the digs, uh, that's a sign as you're going into town. And there's the beach, and that's it's kind of a pea gravel looking stuff, uh, if you can tell. Um, and uh, but that's the beach. That's the Sea of Galilee. And that's where Jesus, very close to where Jesus walked on the water, uh, very close to where Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. All happened along this beach within probably a three, two, two mile area, a very small area. Uh, and then looking back from the beach, uh, if you were to turn and go completely opposite direction, that's probably looking, uh, that's looking east and a little south. If you were to go uh, uh, north and just a little west, you'd be on the, uh, uh, the area where Jesus uh, gave a sermon on the mount and fed the 5,000. All within the very close proximity. It's all pretty close. Um, interesting place. So, and just, just a picture of the water. And I don't know if you see the rocks in the water uh, right there. But that's from some of the old fishing stuff. They had they had built up some of the areas to make kind of a dock, you know, and where the fishermen could come in and offload their fish and whatnot. There's the beach. You can see the palm trees growing the dates and uh, where they get their their honey. And there's uh, Zacchaeus from our group <laughs> who decided he would crawl up into a tree. Uh, see what he could see. It was really hot that day, and we were in the shade. So we did a little devotional there. And there is Capernaum, as we see it today. Now, everything that's black <clears throat> was from, uh, oh, it was from the, uh, before Christ. The black rocks were native rocks. It's volcanic there. So all the black rocks are from that particular area. And what you see down below are the ruins from some of the old houses. And all the way in the background, you can see a, a black rock 
wall that goes all the way around Capernaum. And this white thing over here on the left, I'll get to that in a minute, that's a, a newer synagogue built at the fourth century uh, AD. And so when you're over there, you, you, everything's old. You know, we're over here, we think, well, a couple hundred years old, that's old, that's not old. That's just getting a little bit of patina on it. Uh, over there, they got some old stuff. There's some more of the ruins. And this, I don't know if you can see the pillars on the right side there, this over here. That is a church, a fairly recent development. The church was built over a location, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, that is a picture of the fourth century, uh, you notice the white stone as opposed to the black stone, but that's a fourth century synagogue, very large synagogue, uh, built over the area where uh, Jesus actually said the words. I'm going to read here in just a moment. There's the back of the synagogue. Um, and what you find around synagogues is you find mikvahs. Mikvahs are ritual baths that Jews would go into before going to synagogue. And uh, they would go in. And it has to be a certain dimension, a certain size. They would go in. And yes, they would get buck naked. And they would take a bath. And it's a ritual cleansing. And it has to be living water, where water is flowing through it. It can't be just stagnant water. So there has to be a drain, there has to be an incoming and outgoing water, and that would be it. Uh, while they could just go out to the Sea of Galilee and do it too, because it has water coming in and water going out, but it's a little tougher in the day to get naked in the Sea of Galilee than it is, you know, in a, in a makeup somewhere. There's the yeah, wall again I was telling you about, and you can see the different doorways. That may be kind of an afterthought. Uh, that's uh, the steel is obviously a modern development. They were just trying to keep the back because uh, they didn't want people tearing stuff up. So that's a pretty much a modern development. Uh, but uh, anyway, moving along. That's looking down into one of the houses. Uh, and what they do over there is they just start digging. And you just, as you go down, a lot of these homes, a lot of these towns are built on other towns, other homes. Uh, what's that called? A tell. Yeah, some of you have been studying that on Tuesdays. So it's called a tell. They just, they will rebuild on something. And the way you can tell is it just keeps getting taller. It's after a while, it just, it's almost a mountainous looking thing that they just keep rebuilding on the same area. So uh, as they dig down, now Capernaum's not one of those areas, but as they dig down, you get to just farther and farther back in history. So if you go into Jerusalem and they start digging in Jerusalem, they'll go down and they'll get back there, you know, back to the time of Christ. And if they keep digging, they'll get back to the time of David. And so there's, there's, kind of, there's always this, how far do we keep digging? You know, because we know that the more we dig, the more stuff we're going to find. But when you dig, you unearth the stuff that was there before. So... <clears throat> There's always this argument, well, how much more do we dig? Uh, in, in the area where David's, uh, uh, in the town of David, uh, which is a smaller section of Jerusalem, uh, David's, uh, they know where David's, uh, uh, his palace was, and it's at the top of a hill, kind of overlooks the Mount of Olives and some different things. Um, but how far do you dig? You know? and, and so they, in this particular area, they've done down to where they've gone down to where they feel like they're in, where David's palace was, and so they, they've unearthed a lot of that. But uh, anyway, moving along. I know I'm boring some of you, but I'm trying to, trying to give you a little history on what's going on with Capernaum. Uh, you can see these uh, cylindrical things. Uh, those were used as millstones. Uh, it, you, could, you could get those cranked around, and on the top they would have a, a piece of wood, and there'd be an animal turning those around, and they just dump rain down in it, and it would funnel down, and it would go down a hole at the bottom, and they would collect it in that that's what they found at the site of Capernaum. Just some more of that. More of the same. And you can kind of see a little better what that millstone setup looks like. You have. And everything's rock. I mean, you don't have trees. You're, you're kind of in desert region. And there are some scrub bushes in places, and there are some trees around certain oases, but uh, 
you don't have enough to build a town with. And so you, you build what you've got. And so most of the ancient cities over there are all built out of rock. Can you imagine hewing that and, and cutting that stone? You have to be good at it. And there's the inside of the uh, church. And what they're looking at is underneath that is an eight-sided uh, building that they have unearthed that was a New Testament church. Uh, they believe it to be the home of Peter uh, that was turned into a church down below. And so they're looking kind of down at what was probably an altar down below. I tried to get a picture of it. It didn't turn out going through glass, and it was dark down there. I had you looked at that and said, why did you show us that? I can't see anything. So anyway, uh, that's what that is. They still have services in there. Uh, but that's over the house where they believe Peter, Peter's home. And quite possibly could have been Peter's mother-in-law's home before he inherited it. That's a possibility too. Uh, lots of different traditional stories being passed along. Which one is accurate? Uh, anybody's guess. But we do know it was a church. It was an eight-sided church. Much like it was an octagon facility and I've got some pictures of it you can see down below that's underneath that particular church they were in and there's octagon shape with an octagon in the center of that I'm not sure where they came up with the design for that church up above but I don't think they wanted to mess with the stuff below and alter it in any way that they could help Clickers working part time. Uh, <clears throat> something interesting over there on the left side of the picture. There you can see these, these down here. <clears throat> they do beautiful mosaic floors. The floors are mosaic. They take little chunks of stone and they actually build floors on them. And it's the tile floor. It's gorgeous stuff. Uh, in some places, the I mean the art, artistry is incredible. And you can tell what era it's from based upon the designs. They kind of know what designs were used in a particular day. And there's, like anything else, certain artisans are famous for certain designs in certain areas. That's a little bit of a picture. I don't know if you can see the designs, but it's kind of washed out. This is not so. You'll see some better pictures of these designs, but it just depends on what they had to suffer all these years before they were on Earth. This is what they actually look like. Oh, <clears throat> oh well, that's not, I clicked by it. That's my fault. Uh, this is uh, going to be a fourth century. It's in this fourth century. Uh, and it's a, a synagogue that was built over the synagogue that Jesus is speaking in. So we know that's the synagogue from the fourth century. That's where the West Stones are white. They're not black. But this is the place where Jesus would have said the words that we're getting ready to read here in just a moment. And this is just an entranceway going in. One of the steps that goes into the... Uh, there's another more important step I'll show you here in just a little bit. But that's the inside of the synagogue. Again, you've got some areas where there's some stuff that's been redone, but you can see the amazing pillars and walls that go around. Um, and the little seats along the side. Uh, but this is in a small town, 15 to 1,800 people probably in this little town. But this was the synagogue that was built in this little town. And this stone would have been brought in from probably over Jerusalem, uh, around that area, uh, which was, I don't know, 25, 30 miles away perhaps. Uh, but to build this, it's probably where it came from. I'm afraid to click this too many times because when I do, I go past two slides at once. John, could you bump up one more for me, please? It's my not bumping for whatever reason. teaching and stuff over here in the side. Uh, the synagogue itself was a place made, 
basically that's where they held their their uh, worship service type of thing. But over here inside, throughout the week and throughout the days, this is where Pete, Jesus would have taught near in this particular area. Now, not this particular stone structure, because the one he taught in was was torn down uh, about seventy something A.D. after the Romans came in and tore some stuff down. But the area that Jesus was speaking in would have been just right under here. That makes any sense at all. And you've already saw the picture of the lake to know what the view's like over there, what the weather's like, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's a beautiful place. If you're going to be ministering, this is a great place to be. That's just, again, that side room uh, past the pillars. But we're still in the synagogue. And there's just the seating. Uh, and again, this is still inside this, the synagogue proper. And there's Kathy. And I don't know if you can see what she's standing on right there, that black step. That's the original step from the original synagogue that Jesus would have had to walk over to get into the synagogue. And that's why I had her stand on that step. Uh, there's just, when you think of history and you think of your history, you think of where you've come from to get where you are, this, this, these are the places. This is, this is what did it for us. Uh, this is where it all came from. Uh, so now you've got a little better picture of where what I'm about to read happened, uh, a little better understanding. And uh, I want to read from John's Gospel, chapter 6. And I'm going to read from verse 56 through 69. And forgive me, John, you don't have to go back and do this. I'll just read it so you don't have to backtrack because I've got it all out of order for John. And I, I apologize, John. And Jesus said this while standing in this temple, excuse me, synagogue. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate man and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does, any, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? He says, the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. They're receiving them as physical words. He said, I'm speaking to you about spiritual things. He goes on to say, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Every Jew celebrates Shabbat. Shabbat is the Sabbath. Or if you prefer, they honor the Sabbath. Shabbat is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. And to start Shabbat, they have candles, wine, or grape juice, and bread. And before anyone does anything, the candles are blessed and they're lit, and then there's a blessing over bread, and then somebody blesses the bread and breaks the bread, and they pass it around the table. Then the blessing is made over the wine, and the cup is passed, allowing everyone to drink from it. And this is the beginning of Shabbat. It usually starts when they sit down and they're prepared, to, all the food's prepared, they're getting ready to sit down and eat their dinner on Friday night. It's the beginning of Shabbat. But it starts by thanking God for his life, for his creation, and for his provisions. Jesus has quite a few people following him here at Capernaum, and they're excited to do so, but Jesus says something now that has them very perplexed. Even his faithful twelve are having a hard time grasping this new teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. 
I mean, if somebody told you, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, you'd probably make a beeline for the door. If I said the one who feeds on me will live because of me, or he who feeds on this bread will live forever, very few people would probably be back next week. Unless you were following the Lord Jesus, and not just for the free food as some of these people were that were following him now. Maybe you followed him because you watched him heal people, and it was kind of a like a magic trick. Lots of different reasons people follow Jesus. Not all for the right reasons. Jesus was teaching them, or trying to teach them, a spiritual principle of the new covenant, but they were all brought up being taught about the physical world and the Mosaic law and the covenant of Abraham. Most of them couldn't grasp the spiritual, let alone make a connection about something that hadn't happened to Jesus yet. Twelve apostles see everybody else walk out on Jesus, and they're, they're wondering if they should too, I suspect. And Jesus says, you don't want to leave too, do you? I'm thinking, that's quite a pitch, you know, for somebody who's starting a movement. You don't want to leave too, do you? I'm not sure the uh, gurus of, of how to pitch things and how to start a movement would say that's the way to go. They didn't really know what to say. While they had all left previous professions to follow Jesus, many of them could have gone back to their previous jobs. No doubt they thought about what they'd given up, and they thought about all they'd seen Jesus do up to this point, and their response to Jesus' question, Peter spoke. And he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You're saying, do you want to leave? Well, who are we going to go to? Who are we going to follow if not you? He said, you have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. In other words, we believe you're the Messiah. We believe you're it. He said, we don't understand what you mean by this teaching, but we believe that you are the Messiah, and there's nowhere else we can go to have eternal life. We know we can go outside, and most of us can go back to our old jobs, but those jobs are only going to provide for our temporal needs, and those old jobs won't allow us to see this Hicks sick healed or to be a part of that process or proclaim the salvation of God and reach people with the knowledge of Christ that we possess. You see, when you come to fully believe in Christ, you'll know it because it will change how you live your life. You won't be wishy-washy. In the tough times, you'll stay the course. You'll stay where you need to be. And I'm not talking about a belief that does nothing to alter the way you live here. I'm talking about a belief that costs you everything. The belief that calls you to alter your life once you are called. I'm talking about a belief where you hear Jesus say, Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm talking about a belief that demands you freely give up your life to take up your cross and to follow him. Jesus calls out to anybody that will eat from the body of Christ, to drink from the cup of his blood, and take his life into their bodies and into the world. Specifically, Jesus said, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the Father, excuse me, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I'm the one. They ate manna, they died. You, you draw from me, you will live forever. In a moment, we'll look at the Shabbat blessings. Shabbat is... Sabbath. And you'll see some serious similarities to Jesus' teaching here. You'll see similarities because Jesus was celebrating Passover and Shabbat when he introduced the communion to his disciples. Understanding the Shabbat blessings also gives you a little better understanding of God, what God wants you to grasp during communion. For instance, the first blessing where everybody wishes each other peace, they say, Shabbat Shalom, and your response is, Shabbat Shalom. Let's try it. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. That implies Shalom means much more than peace. <clears throat> Shabbat is Sabbath. So Shabbat Shalom is blessed Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Peaceful Sabbath. Shalom implies wholeness, completeness, and well-being in every aspect of your life. And Jesus showed his desire to bring that to his people in the entire time he was ministering to them. <clears throat> Jews begin their Sabbath on Friday before sundown, and, and after wishing one another Shabbat Shalom, 
They begin by thanking God for the ability to honor God during Shabbat. It's a Jewish custom to light two candles. It represents the two passages in the Torah, which are commanded to keep the Shabbat. The first occurs in Exodus 20 and 8, which states, Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And the second, Deuteronomy 5.12, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Shabbat is, as I said, sundown to sundown, Friday to Saturday. The seventh day every week, <clears throat> and uh, more, actually, more Shabbats are built into the high holy days. It's not just Shabbat only on Friday, but during Passover, <clears throat> excuse me, other times, uh, Pentecost, we were in Jerusalem for the Pentecost. They, they, had, a, they had a long Shabbat. That was a three-day Shabbat there. That was fun. And they had a great time. It was family. It was food. It was fellowship. There was no work. I didn't see anybody sitting over on the side working on their laptop or doing their cell phones and, you know, off in the corner somewhere. They were unplugged for the Sabbath. Sabbath was a day of rest. We could learn something from that. We could learn to rest in God again. I want to go one more picture if we can. If it will let me forward one. Well, there's some of the people we went there with were just trying to find shade. It was so stinking hot that day. That's when the real heat started. But that's uh, the last of the temple there. Or the temple, excuse me, synagogue. Let me go one more. We've got new batteries, but for some reason it doesn't want to always advance for me. John, could you go one more for me? Pretty please, with sugar on top. And whipped cream. And a cherry. Well, anyway, that's all right. If you can get one more, feel free. What I'd like to do uh, today is to just give you an idea of what Shabbat is like. Just to and, and picture sitting around a large table, Thanksgiving, if you will. Every Friday night is Thanksgiving. Right? Kind of get that in your head. And you're sitting around a table, but before the food is ever served, before you fill your plate, before it's even brought out, you'll see something like this. You'd see a cup with wine. You'd see a loaf of bread. There we go. There's Shabbat. So if you can see the bread down below, I lost my pointer. So what's the point? This bread down here, you see how it's kind of folded in, braided? That's called a challah. And that's what I should have bought, but Walmart didn't sell those. So I didn't get one of those. 